Hey everybody, so uh, this is the recorded interview today with um, Kate Conliff. Uh, Kate and I have worked together off and on for years and years now, um, and I'll have Kate introduce herself, but uh, we'll also talk a little bit about her business school experience and about um, working with Adio in the human centered design model. So Kate, they're using Adio's um, field guide um, as their textbook for the course. So we're in the inspiration phase. Um, we've done uh, frame your design question and now we're looking at interview guides. So uh, they're getting both an interview and a discussion of the framework. So. I'll go on mute. Um, could you just give us a quick rundown, starting with where you're from and sort of what your path has been to this point? Sure. Um, hi, guys. So I'm excited to be here. So my name is Kate Conliffe. Um, I'm from New York. I have had a mixed career in um, mostly in the healthcare space in both larger institutions and also in the entrepreneurial space. Um, I was the I, did some consulting to start my career, um, spent about 10 years leading what's now the Clinton Health Access Initiative, um, and worked with Kara at, to get Baby and Company, which is a multi-site birth center company, started and off the ground and to help grow it. Um, and I now lead a new maternity care venture. Did you talk a little bit, Kate, about um, sort of the skills that you learned as a young management consultant or in the consultant arena that have kind of helped as you've transitioned into more entrepreneurial um, ventures? Yeah, sure. So um, one of the things that I loved about consulting is that with each new engagement, you're going into um, a space and really looking at a problem that for the company is one that they've dealt with for a long time, but for you is um, you know, a new problem to solve. And so you have to go in and learn about the space, um, make sure that you practice um, active listening and that you're really thoughtful, put yourself in the shoes of the client that you're serving and um, also their customer. Um, so that you can structure, uh, really understand the need, their needs, structure the problem appropriately, um, and then apply a series of analytical tools to solve their problem. Um, and so I think um, in terms of the skills that both gives you um, uh, the sort of the same need finding skills that it sounds like you guys are going through with the IDEO process of really trying to um, understand a problem from someone else's perspective. Um, ask the right questions, um, and then uh, you know structure structure the problem problem solving in a way that you you're sure sort of addresses all of the comprehensive needs. So that's right. So we've got this um, sort of big, broad definition of problems going, and they're working in teams or on their own, and have have sort of defined a problem as as your career sort of led into the global health space. Could you talk a little about um, what the problem we were all thinking about was, but then specifically how uh, working with the generic drug manufacturers for non-branded ARVs kind of came to be identified as a big part of the problem and kind of what the steps through to a solution were there? Um, sure, uh, that that's there's a lot of different things in there, but we, um, in terms of the problem we were all trying to solve, and this is another place where, where Dr. Osborne and I work together, but um, we, um, at the time, um, HIV treatment was relatively broadly available and certainly proven in terms of its effectiveness in the United States and in developed countries, um, and yet was really broadly not available in the developing world setting. Um, and so what we were doing is trying to figure out how to take what was a proven medical intervention and bring it to scale um, in a setting where it wasn't available. Um, and there were really ultimately two parts of the problem that the Clinton Health Access Initiative anyway were, were going after. Um, one was helping developing world governments build their management capacity to grow those treatment programs. And then the other was 
working with um, pharmaceutical and medical diagnostic companies to think about how to bring products to market in those resource poor settings. Um, and so it's in that context that the generic um, pharmaceutical work started. Um, there, are, for those of you that don't know, there are um, in the United States, mostly we, we buy, well, actually that's not true, we buy both branded drugs. So those are drugs that companies have helped to sort of come up with and develop and then brand and market. And then there are other companies that as patents expire, develop generic versions of those drugs. And because those companies haven't had to invest um, in the research and development, they tend to be less expensive. Um, and so we were working with those companies um, to think about how to bring those products to market in developing world, developing world settings. Um, and again, it was a lot of the same um, concepts that we talked about with consulting, which was really thinking about putting ourselves in the shoes of the, of the generic companies and thinking about the challenges that they faced as we asked them to sell those products more broadly and more cheaply in resource poor settings, helping them solve those problems so that we could ultimately um, get the products to be less expensive for the people that we were serving. We've talked a little in class about how important interviewing is in terms of really getting to the heart of where the roadblocks are and what the sort of narrowing in various, in this case that we're talking about, sort of um, product or production channels. So just using the ARV experience as sort of an example, you know, we sort of knew that um, it was going to be difficult for the companies to produce the drugs and to sell them at the price point that we were sort of, um, we, the broad we of the Clinton Foundation's Health Access Initiative, uh, talking about um, needing them to be available at. But uh, could you talk about how interviews kind of informed um, informed the team in thinking about where where the roadblocks are and what your own sort of approach to um, a stakeholder interview might be sort of generally? Yeah, sure. So um, in terms of the role that interviewing played in the antiretroviral work, um, there had been a lot of organizations and, and people working on the problem of high drug pricing for a long time. Um, and so we spent a lot of time up front talking both to the stakeholders, the global stakeholders that have been working on it, the stakeholders at the country level that have been working on it, and then the antiretroviral companies themselves to really try to, as I said, better understand um, the specific challenges that they faced in producing the products that we were talking about at different volume points so that we could try to, as we grew the treatment programs, try to help them solve the challenges that they were facing um, rather than coming at it from an assumption of understanding those challenges. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, we went in <coughs> um, uh, really thinking that just by bringing together um, sort of volume pro promises of high volume, we could, we could um, negotiate lower prices. And what we learned through the interview process was one, um, that the drug companies really needed to see um, uh, the financing behind the, um, those volume commitments because they, what we learned is that they'd had those volume commitments shared with them before um, and they didn't trust that they were there. And so that led to a whole stream of work for us around uh, working with the funders of treatment programs to really get them to come to the table with us so that they had that confidence. And then two, we learned that they really hadn't thought through how they would change their production lines at scale to lower their own costs, um, which we had um, not understood was a gap before. And so we brought in teams of manufacturing experts to help those companies think about how to solve that problem. And ultimately it was that work, those two, those two pieces of the work that allowed us to be successful in the negotiation process. So if we hadn't started with those interviews to really understand that challenge, we probably would have jumped right into negotiations and ultimately not been successful in that effort. Yeah, thanks. You made exactly the point I was hoping that you would, which is, you know, if you go in with a set of assumptions, you have to be uh, really careful that you're 
pushing out those assumptions to make sure that you're not missing something. You know, I think had it not, had the production line conversations not come up and then had you not gone all the way back to sort of the initial substrate manufacturers, it wouldn't have mattered what the volume was uh, in terms of the, that ultimate um, pricing negotiation. That's exactly right. We, we assumed, as I said, that, that the volume plus, um, quite frankly, the PR uh, uh, bump that, that the companies did and would get from being associated with President Clinton's foundation would be enough. And while those two things were important to them, exactly as you just said, without that incremental piece of work and the funders at the table, we really would not have made the gains um, that we did. So, exactly. yeah, and then just in general, sort of, you know, having grown up in that environment, I feel like you and I both have this sort of, um, you know, general approach to work that is an interview style in and of itself of sort of just asking a lot of questions and asking a lot of questions, maybe even most importantly, when you think you already know the answer. Um, but now in your sort of current um, position, you're working in maternity care, we've, we've worked in the maternity care space before, what are some of the places where maybe you had some assumptions where you've needed to ask more questions or gotten different perspectives, sort of this go around? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, particularly in an entrepreneurial effort, but but certainly in this one, we I'll answer the specific question in a second, but asking questions on an ongoing basis is critical because the um, you, know, you only always you always only see a given problem from the perspective from which you came. So, um, you know, um, I have previously worked in the maternity care setting outside of the hospital structure, negotiating sort of across the table from a hospital, um, and so I had a view of the challenges they faced that um, uh, weren't necessarily reflective of. The full the full set of um, the full set of things that they were were grappling with. So, um, you know, I was aware of some of the market challenges that they were facing in terms of competitive dynamics in the market. I was aware of some of the differences of clinical opinion that they were struggling to sort of try to manage. Um, but until I really got into their economics, I didn't fully understand or appreciate. Um, the challenges in managing um, their their uh, what's called their their sort of laborist program, so the providing twenty four seven staffing on a labor floor. Um, I hadn't really understood those economic challenges, and until I did, uh, our company is is helping to support hospitals to reimagine their care programs. We couldn't possibly appropriately structure the staffing model that we were thinking about. So we had been thinking about it from the patient perspective, built a staffing model that was appropriate for the patient, and that's critical, and we won't lose sight of that. But until we really understood the economic challenges on their side, we weren't necessarily staffing it appropriately from their perspective. Great. I know we've kind of bounced around a little bit, but uh, you decided to go to business school sort of halfway through what, you know, a typical career path looks like. Could you talk a little about what sort of led you there and then how you chose the school you went to and then sort of what your experience in business school looked like? Yeah. Um, so when I went to business school, it was in part because there were I thought I had perceived functional gaps in my knowledge. So I didn't have a lot of background. I'd done consulting at that point. I'd done the work we talked about in global health, but I didn't have a lot of traditional training in finance, for example. And so I went into business school sort of thinking that that's what I wanted to get out of it. Um, and I was looking for a general management program. I ended up at Harvard Business School and was looking for a program that um, would let me apply, learn those functional skills, but apply them to broad management challenges. Um, but what I found actually that I got most out of business school was the um, reinforcement of some of the skills I talked about in consulting, of being able to look at a new problem critically, quickly identify the unanswered questions, um, ask those questions and come to a hypothesis 
about what the problem is or the solution should be and have enough confidence to really you know, drive hypothesis driven, make hypothesis driven decisions um, and learn iteratively over time, which I think is actually served me really well as I've applied that to sort of entrepreneurial ventures where you have to make decisions with limited and sometimes imperfect sets of data, um, have the confidence to make them, know the assumptions you're making going into them and continuously test those assumptions to sort of iterate on whatever problem you're solving. And I think that's probably what I got out of business school um, the most was the confidence to do that. And then coming out of business school uh, and entering sort of a set of more entrepreneurial ventures, including your own consulting um, work, by the way, uh, what were the sort of pieces and parts of the business school experience that um, helped you maybe make the leap out of a more sort of organization-based or well well um, developed structure into a more entrepreneurial environment or was that in fact a hindrance <laughs> um i don't i don't think it was a hindrance by any means i think um you know one of the things that business school gives you is exposure to um sort of the broad set of challenges and opportunities that are out there um and so it sparked in me a variety, you know, a curiosity um, and a desire to uh, sort of apply the um, knowledge that I'd gained and go after the problems that um, I got to learn about in business school. And so I think that was part of it. I think, um, uh, and again, some of it was that confidence that I talked about, which is I think the biggest thing that, that business school gives you, or at least gave me. Um, and I think if I'm honest though, some of that is, is, was in who I am. I think whether you work in a large organization or whether you decide to be an entrepreneur, um, a lot of being successful is about knowing who you are and what you're good at and what um, gets you excited. And so uh, for me, some of what I got out of business school was just the space and time to really be thoughtful about that. Um, and for me, the sort of problem solving part and the working in small teams and building something that we all believe is impactful is a lot of what gets me going. So um, some of business school was just the space and time to recognize that. So, but on the nuts and bolts parts of it, so, the, you know, that's certainly a part of it. And, you know, I came from nothing close to a business background coming into um, sort of the entrepreneurial space. What would you say are the kind of core set of nuts and bolts business skills that you actually use frequently and kind of need as an entrepreneur, even if your training is not necessarily in business, um, to sort of uh, create the structure or, you know, have a business that um, has enough, you know, stability organizationally and structurally to kind of get up and running. Um, you know, I don't know if I've thought about it in those terms, but I think the core analytical skills um, that one gains certainly in any kind of finance or strategy um, training uh, are critical um, and they're critical uh, in part because of what I referenced before the context is constantly changing the product is typically iterating and so having a structured way of making data driven decisions is really 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 important I'd say the second thing is, um, the, the, at least in my experience, the, maybe the most important thing is having the right team. So the right set of people that are aligned and um, organized in a way to um, be successful. And so the, um, the having the frameworks that we, that one is taught in business school around Sort of what drive what it takes to create culture and drive culture um i don't know if i've consciously applied them but i certainly have relied back to black on them um, as we've thought about building any kind of organization um so i'd say those are the two things that i would call out most and then certainly whether you have them yourself or whether you you look for them in other people all of particularly as the the and any enterprise grows all of the core functions you know play a role um you know whether it's being smart about 
um, uh, you know, how to structure operations efficiently or smart about how to um, set up a marketing organization or a finance organization. All of that, obviously, in a, in a, in a startup is important. So having um, some frame of reference to at least set it up right and manage it well is, is important. Yeah, I mean, certainly that was the big gap for me was just the basic, um, you know, I have a doctorate in math. It's not like I can't run a spreadsheet, but the sort of basic lingo of, you know, a P&L and what the lines mean and what are the variables that go into an EBITDA or like things that, you know, are certainly quite straightforward, but someone coming out of um, a non-business background was a little daunting to take on this whole new um, set of uh, language and variables that you know hadn't been my experience in the past. So I think it's important, and certainly most of the students in this course are business majors and will will have that. But we do have a few people who are coming out of engineering or software backgrounds um, who you know are sort of going through that process of, of learning those um, somewhat fundamental kind of core nuts and bolts business skills. The other thing that you and I have certainly spent tons of time doing that I think is um, important uh, to your point about building a team is um, dealing with organizational documents, you know, just the basic operating agreement of the company and you know, we went through a lot of joint venture agreements and sort of knowing enough of what your lawyer's talking about to um, sort of get through that. Any advice on uh, choosing and working with your attorney? <laughs> um, only that it's one of the most important relationships you'll have, so choose wisely. I think, um, uh, you know, for me, Obviously, you need to find someone who knows the law inside and out and is going to make sure that what you what you build is um, appropriate and compliant and help you through any negotiations that you have. Um, but also having someone who has some level of business sense, you know, to help you balance um, balance the decisions that you're making, which are, you know, in, often about, you know, what level of risk you're willing to take on. Um, and so uh, I guess that's all, that's all I would say is, is make sure you have someone that you like working with that you think is able to understand your business and um, help you balance the, the, the business and legal um, challenges that you face. So just for fun, um, thank you. That was most of what I hope to get through, but just for fun, uh, could you talk a little bit about um, the global health work and sort of the various uh, countries that you worked with and for and in, um, you know, we're all on lockdown at the moment and can't travel. So for those of us who have a little wonder list, uh, <laughs> I'm sure you don't have like a list to rattle off, but maybe you could talk a little bit about um, just projects in certain countries. So unfortunately, um, the wonders of um, lockdown, the Zoom was cutting in and out a little bit, but I think you were asking about um, giving some examples of the countries that we worked in at the Clinton Health Access Initiative. Yeah, um, yeah, we were uh, incredibly, incredibly lucky to work with some incredible um, government programs and we worked in <clears throat> um, really throughout Southern and um, uh, Eastern Africa um, in Asia and in the Caribbean. Kara and I worked together um, at least tangentially, both in um, the Dominican Republic and in Haiti. Uh, no, yes, the D Jamaica and in Haiti, not the Dominican mm -hmm. Republic and in Haiti, though we did work in the Dominican Republic the also. Dominican too, kind of. Um, and, um, but then um, all over Southern Africa, we spent a lot of time working, helping the government, supporting the government of South Africa to build their um, first HIV treatment um, program or treat scale up plan for, for their treatment program. Um, we worked with the Zambian government, the Malawian government, the Rwandan government um, on a variety of, of areas, helping them <clears throat> um, with uh, drug supply and distribution issues, again, helping them on their overall treatment programs, helping them think about how to scale up their um, uh, or manage their, their human resources for health. Um, so 
was really lucky to work in, with a range of incredible people and incredible places. Could you just um, talk a little about, I think, particularly from a student perspective, sort of global health work with a partner government sounds like such a different thing than running a sort of stereotypical for-profit, you know, retail business, for example, in the U.S. But my experience has been that actually they're, they're very similar in many ways. Um, and, you know, it's really the context that's different, but a lot of the core sort of functionality is the same. Could you just kind of comment on what you found the similarities and or differences to be? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I actually find the work to be quite similar. Um, you know, the, the P&L is a little bit different in that you're looking to um, balance a budget rather than to create a profit necessarily. But nonetheless, particularly in developing world, the developing world context, um, the resources to fund the programs that you're trying to build um, come from in a from a competitive place. So in, in some ways, the product that you're building, you've got to build a product that both delivers value for the patients that you're serving and also um, is well received by the, the investors in the health system. And so in a lot of ways, um, the overall um, problem that you're working on is similar in that respect. The business that you're managing is similar in that respect. And then the problems that you're struggling with are very, very similar. It's about organizing people, processes, um, and systems to deliver the service or the product that you're um, that you're collectively trying to, to build. So um, I actually think the, the core functions are very similar, um, even if the, um, the service that you're delivering or the, the P&L view is slightly different. I totally agree. Anything else that you would tell uh, just over 100 undergraduate entrepreneurship students? No, other than I'm excited to see what you do. I think the, you know, the, the recent context that we're living in makes the, um, you know, brings the challenges we face as a country and a world into stark relief, but also that means that also bring the brings the opportunities into stark relief. And so um, it's exciting to think about so many of you at the beginnings of your career. And um, I think the most important thing, I sort of said it already, but to me is to really think critically about um, who you are and what you want to spend your career doing in terms of your passion and your skill set. And if you follow that, the rest will sort of fall into place. So, well, thanks for your time. I know you've got a lot going on. Um, and for the class, I'll put it in the Flipgrid, but uh, for your response, just sort of tell us what your key uh, takeaways from today were. Um, and I will see you guys again on Friday.